Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I would love to hear the energy in the room. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi, bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Okay. All right. Excellencies, all protocol observed. Good afternoon. My name is Joanny. I'm a medical doctor and women's health researcher. I also advise senior leaders on the global health and gender equality portfolio. But today, I'm so excited to be moderating the plenary. So welcome, welcome again to this important plenary focused on sexual, reproductive health and right and bodily autonomy. As you certainly know, and I'm sure you are aware, we have witnessed significant pushback when it comes to SRHR and bodily autonomy. Girls, women, gender diverse people, the right to choose for their own body is constantly under attack. Fortunately, in other parts of the world, progress is being made. There is hope. And this conversation will build on hope. That's the reason why this conversation will focus on three key pillars. The first one, comprehensive SRHR for all. The second one, bodily autonomy and right-based framing. And the third one, abortion right. I'm particularly excited about this plenary because I breathe SRHR, and I'm sure you too. So now it's my pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker. She is the president and the founder of Common Sense Childbirth. She is a Time Magazine Women of the Year awardee. She is one of the world's most respected, renowned, influential midwife and public health leader, Mrs. Jenny Joseph. Please welcome on stage. Let's make some noise for her, Mrs. Jenny Joseph. Good afternoon, good day, hi everybody. Thank you, thank you for being here. I have a question, so what does it look like when you see sexual and reproductive health and rights embodied? Or even more, what does it feel like? So as I'm speaking, I want you just to kind of check into that. How often do you see positive, strong images of black and brown women, pregnant women at that? I created a coffee table book in 2007, a collection of images, and I named it Beautiful, Images of Health, Joy, and Vitality in Pregnancy and Birth. I just re-released it in April of this year because although these babies and teenagers that are in that book are now grown healthy and doing great, I still haven't seen anything like it as far as documenting our health and well-being. Have you? So I'm a midwife, a British trained, you might be able to tell. Midwife means with woman, and I've been deep in this work for 42 years at this time. Yep, I started when I was 19, and I was just a baby myself. But here's what I want to talk about today. Our health, your health, your loved one's health, and their human rights to access the best possible version of that health. You probably have a story of your own, or your close friend, or your family member, a story that even now might reduce you to tears as you remember perhaps that sense of helpless unease, that fear, that frustration, that powerlessness, or maybe even shame. For women, many of our stories are related to pregnancy, delivery, postpartum, and gynecological experiences, and some of these stories never leave us. Some of us, many of us, are never the same again. We all want the same thing if we happen to end up being the patient, right? We want to be at the center of the experience. We want to be respected. We want to be listened to, to be understood, and invited to share in the decision making. And when that is missing, people suffer. Patients suffer. 
Their loved ones suffer, providers suffer, health systems suffer because if the patient isn't centered, everybody is suffering. Yeah. So midwifery is patient-centered care, person-centered care, always has been, always will be. Midwifery means with woman, and when we are talking about maternal health and perinatal health, in fact, we are really talking about saving lives, women's lives, birthing people's lives, babies' lives, children's lives. And when we really should talk, I'm sorry, we really should talk about the midwifery model of care, because in this context, midwifery matters. I've lived and worked in the United States for 34 years now. I'm still horrified as to what is happening in plain sight. Three to four times as many black women die during pregnancy, birth, or postpartum as white women in the United States. And the numbers are increasing. And even more alarming is the increase in severe pregnancy-related complications that nearly cause death. These are known as near miss incidents. If you nearly died, or you just squeaked through, you're not really counted, are you? There are four million births annually in the USA. How many near miss events, near -miss events are going unreported? Women don't share. Is it 50,000, 100,000, half a million, two million? I coined the phrase maternal toxic as a way to describe what I see as the environmental impact on mothers, whether pregnant or parenting, which creates a toxicity around her that she or the mother baby dyad or her kids are not safe. And I don't just mean those disenfranchised areas where lack of resources, poverty, crime are rife. No, it's not that. It's more than that. Let's not fall into the trap of thinking that poor health and obstetric outcomes must be inextricably linked to social determinants of health, or because of women making poor choices, or not caring about their babies, or other convenient tropes that would be all too easy to continue to blame the women themselves. No, we need to mind, remind ourselves that until we can offer all women autonomy and choice about their bodies, until we can give true informed consent with real information and support informed refusal, until we can step into their shoes and walk around in them for a little while, until our health systems concede some of this perinatal power, until we can just listen, zip it up and truly listen to women, we will not see the changes we're looking for. We will not see women and families and parents who look and feel like they're getting the best sexual and reproductive health that they deserve. Additionally, we will also continue to see the burnout, the stress, and the falling away of our providers because we're all working under the same unjust, unrealistic, and often unsustainable systems. We are suffering due to the moral injury, our own lack of autonomy, our continued lack of power causes. That is also the toxicity that we are all burdened with if we don't make these changes. Midwives are the answers. Midwives need support. It's time to invest realistically in midwifery. We need to start addressing why a profession that is 97% women that supports and upholds women's rights are left out of decision-making spaces and are wholly underfunded? It's because it's a gendered issue. The PUSH campaign exists to support and coordinate the many grassroots initiatives that exist all over the world to collectively and more effectively advocate for increased investment and resourcing of midwives. If you're a donor in this room, centre midwives in your portfolio. If you're a woman's fund, centre midwives in your portfolio. If you're a government, centre midwives in your health systems. If you're a... This is a key solution to reducing maternal death and upholding women's rights and bodily autonomy. What if every person had access to the midwifery model of care to support, encouragement, and information with their respect and dignity intact? What if she felt at peace, confident, safe? What if she could look like a beautiful princess 
goddess queen that she truly is. Would that make a difference? Did it matter for you? Seems to me we have enough evidence. Where is the evidence-based outrage? When it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights, it's time to tell the truth. This is a matter of life and death. Let's get to it because the result of this effort is just plain beautiful. Thank you very much. inspiring keynote remark. Wasn't it an inspiring keynote remark? <laughs> so I want to thank Mrs. Jenny Joseph for such an inspiring remark. She highlighted key disparities in maternal and child health. And she pointed out that there is an urgency for action. We need to act now and not tomorrow. She also highlighted the role that midwives play in strengthening health system locally, domestically, and globally. And finally, she made a strong call to action. Once again, the urgency to act now and not tomorrow. Well, this was a great way to set the tone for the upcoming panel which, like I said initially, will be focused on SRHR and bodily autonomy. While the team is helping set the stage, I would like to remind us, we are able to go in space. We are able to explore oceans, right? But we still don't know how to remove, completely remove barriers to assess SRHR services. We still don't know how to strategize and connect with each other to expand girls, women's, and everyone's access to comprehensive SRHR. For this first panel, I would like to please invite you to help me welcome on stage our distinguished speakers and panelists. Please let's welcome them on stage with a round of applause. They cannot hear the round of applause, so they're just waiting to hear more noise for them. Welcome Dr. Natalia Kanem, Dr. Anita Zaidi, Honorable Dr. Mezaret Zilalem, Mrs. Catalina Devandas Aguilar, Dr. Samukeli Sodube, Mr. Kevin Ali, and Mrs. Esther Okech. Welcome on stage. Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali. Distinguished speakers, VIPs, excellencies, welcome again. Like I was mentioning before, this panel is focused on sexual reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy. Before you made your entrance, I was highlighting the fact that we as a society, we have the capacity to go in space, to explore the moon. We have the capacity to explore oceans, but as a society, we are still thinking about how to strategize and remove barriers for girls, women, and all when it comes to the sexual reproductive health and rights. So today, I would like to introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Natalia Kanem, she is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UNFPA, the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. Dr. Anita Zaidi, she is the president of the Gender Equality Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yes. 
Honorable Dr. Mesuret Elalem. She's the director of the Maternal Child, Adolescent, Youth, and Nutrition Health at the Ethiopia Federal Ministry of Health. <laughs> Mrs. Catalina de Vanos Aguilar, human rights lawyer, first United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Dr. Samuel Kelly Sodube, Executive Director of FP2030, a platform to advance family planning globally. <laughs> Mrs. Easter, Easter Okech, Executive Director and Program Coordinator for Kefiado, Kenyan Female Advisory Organization. And Mr. Kevin Ali, our he for she, like we say, supportive of gender equality, and we do need a lot of he for she's. He's the CEO and the board member of Organon, a women's leading, women's health leading company. Welcome, Mr. Ali. <laughs> so, so let's start this panel by asking thought-provoking questions. How can we remove, let's first acknowledge that there are key barriers that girls, women, and all are facing when it comes to assessing comprehensive sexual and reproductive health, but also ensuring bodily autonomy. Dr. Kanem, what are some of those barriers, some of those gaps, and how can we change this issue? Well, thanks so much. And I also want to thank Jenny for what she said about midwifery and midwives saving lives. Being here at Women Deliver with you, for me, for UNFPA, is a real opportunity to carry on the work of our foremothers, our mothers, our grandmothers, and our godmothers. And insisting on bodily autonomy is, to me, part of the deal. When I think about priorities for the future, I totally agree that the innovation that it takes to imagine a future where we get to space exists with us right here, right now. And uh, our hashtag body right campaign is part of what UNFPA is contributing to reordering the world. When we think about technology, we want to see technology in women's hands. We want to see the design of products imagining what the woman is going to use it for from the beginning, from the inception. And much as we've also sounded the alarm about technology-facilitated gender-based violence, a negative, which creates depression and so much upheaval on social media, and we insist that online spaces should be safe spaces, we also see the huge potential for technology to be able to harness the power that exists in the imagination of young leaders. The private sector as business orients itself so that women can thrive mm -hmm. rather than being an afterthought. And in particular, I think, bringing attention to how partnership and speaking up makes a difference. So for example, our business advisory group partnership and our Equity Alliance 2030 efforts are trying to mainstream the idea, working with partners in the UN, UN Women, and so many others, including uh, our, our special rapporteur who's with us on disabilities. If you have a situation where you pretest, if I, for example, uh, can't hear, mm -hmm. I should be planned for prior to the hurricane, the earthquake, the disaster. If I'm a menopausal woman, which I am, <laughs> the workplace should accommodate to my needs much as schools should accommodate to the needs of girls who menstruate. Normal, natural, let's talk about it, let's wear the bracelet. So ultimately, I think that we should not allow technology to actually silence what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We should claim our body right and our birthright and not be shy to call out misogyny, patriarchy, things that really hurt people's feelings. So we sit silently by and we think, oh my gosh, that's a shame. 
whereas the aggressor, the perpetrator, is so vocal and visible and overwhelming us. Well, we are the counterforce, and I think this is a big part of the answer. Bodily autonomy allows people to assert their human rights, and we're 100% for that. You said it so perfectly. Please, a round of applause for that. We need to claim our rights. And I want to stay with you, Dr. Kanem, talking about rights. What do you think about the right-based framing approach? How can we make sure that right-based framing strengthen SIHR advocacy and gender equality so that we can reach our common goal? You know, I think... Uh it's obvious that a lot of what we're working on as a movement, as a feminist movement, we've sort of had our ideals. We know that we want to end FGM by 2030. We also know that gender-based violence, okay, may have been there since the time of the cave era, but the day to stop it is today, right now. The rights approach is a huge advantage for us. We stand on the moral high ground. We are the defenders of a girl in a village who may not be in this room, but Esther and others are carrying her position. The idea of who owns your body is fundamental. When you can be, quote unquote, married off at the age of nine, 10, 11, 12, this is an abrogation of a fundamental human right. And if the girl herself is not aware, if you don't know what your rights are, you're at so much of a disadvantage. For example, with the Body Right Campaign, mm -hmm. we've transformed this issue of the misuse of the image of a young woman, the boyfriend who leaks the naked picture or whatever it may be, the insult that's there on the web forever, into a rights issue where by claiming your rights and saying you're the one who is wrong here, I'm not gonna hide in shame, I am not the uh, perpetrator, you are. The transformation of that dynamic is so empowering for young people. I've declared over and over my trust in this next upcoming generation. I have stated publicly that it is so important for young people to lead and I think Women Deliver has done that in terms of crafting this sets of meetings. But I also would like to see uh, the vociferous rights-based claiming of SRHR for the defenders to feel confident that we are going to stand strong. And yes, there is pushback, but again, I think the vast majority of right-thinking people want women's equality. And that's what we're going to stand up for, and the uh, human rights platform is our advantage. Thank you, Dr. Cannon. We need to stand strong despite the pushbacks, despite the challenges that we are facing. And this is a good transition to come to Dr. Zaidi. You are leading a gender equality division within a large foundation. What do you think about some of the existing barriers and gap when it comes to expanding access to SIHR. Thank you, uh, Joanie, for inviting me to this panel, and I'm just so delighted to be here. Um, when I think about barriers to family planning, I think about three sort of really big issues that are affecting the community uh, right now for family planning, sex, sexual reproductive health. There is a very big financing gap in family planning right now, and this manifests itself in many different ways. One of the things that we've really uh, uh, looked at is the, the commodities, the products that are available so that women can have access, uh, access to them. And why, why do we have a financing gap? Uh, actually, several concurrent things are happening which is making it worse. One, the co impact of COVID and the impact that it's had on health systems and constrained budgets around the, around the world, donor countries as well as uh, uh, LMICs. Two is that actually uh, we, uh, girls and women uh, are wanting family plan planning products, so demand is going up. Girls are getting educated. They want to control their reproductive uh, choices, um, and population is growing. So demand is higher, but funding is stagnating or declining, and I see it as a very big barrier right now, which we must address. 
Second issue is lack of chronic under investment or under, uh, under investment in primary health care systems. Primary health care systems are staffed by women. There is a lack of investment in frontline health care workers, midwives, community health workers. And uh, there is a lack of recognition that primary health care systems serve women but are not designed for women. So what do I mean by that? Women use uh, primary health care services for their own reproductive needs throughout their life, but they also have the societal expectations of the care burden. So women have to take care of children and women have to take care of elderly. So what, wherever you look at primary health care systems, women are the main users of primary health care systems, but we do not think about what women need and what's the impact of a stock out, what's the, uh, of a, uh, a family planning product, what's the impact of having a stock out of a product that she wants but is not there. Uh, if you give her a, uh, she might, so she might come walk long distances, not have a product that she wants or not have any products at all and be told to come back. What is the impact of that uh, on her? So, so these are issues that we must, these are compounding issues. They affect uh, quality of service and they affect availability of commodity. Uh, and we have to address all of these issues to really remove these barriers. Thank you. That's well said. That's absolutely well said. And your response made me, is making me ask you a follow-up question regarding, we know that women's rights are human rights. Girls' rights are human rights. Gender diverse people's rights are human rights. So based on your work and your extensive experience, how can right-based framing strengthen access and advocacy in our work? Yeah, so that's a great uh, question, Joanny. So access to contraception is a human right. Bodily autonomy is a human right. Access to information about contraception is a human right. I was just in Nigeria last month and I saw how advocacy, how powerful advocacy is uh -huh. in, in changing people's minds, in, in uh, making information uh, accessible, in getting to the policies that we need for women to be able to access contraception. One thing that I was really uh, uh, moved by is how much policy change has happened to allow uh, uh, countries around the world uh, to, uh, for task shifting, like mm -hmm. so that frontline mm -hmm. health workers can now deliver products that they were not able to deliver before. So, you know, implants can be placed by midwives. Uh, injections can be given by community health workers. Injection, DMPA SC is a product uh, um, that can actually is available now for self-injection that women can, so women can uh, give it to themselves. So this has had a really huge impact on accessibility and the, uh, uh, you know, if we look at, okay, where do we need more um, advances? It's actually making access to family planning as easy as possible because it is a human right. That's powerful. And talking about human rights, that's a good transition to uh, Mrs. Devendas Aguila, who is everything human right. Can you share with us some of the gaps and barriers that you still see from that perspective when it comes to expand access to SRHR? Thank you very much, Johnny. And I would like to start by highlighting two stories. Um, one story of two colleagues, friends of mine. One, an indigenous woman, uh, 14 years old, she gets raped in her community. Her family asks for reparations and the elders in the community decide to oblige her to marry her perpetrator and she was told, you get a baby and you get a husband to take care of you. Second story, it's a story of Alicia. Alicia is a woman with an intellectual disabilities. She's married, she has a son. She's struggling a lot raising her kid. She decides she doesn't want to have more kids. She goes to the health providers and asks for a sterilization. She says she's tall. She's not capable of making the decision of sterilizing herself. So Alicia outsmarts the system and asks her husband to get a vasectomy. 24 hours later, he gets one. I want to highlight these two stories because I think they summarize the many challenges we have as women with disabilities when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights. 
At least I found a solution, but she wasn't able to decide what to do with her body. In a world where forced sterilizations, involuntary sterilizations of girls and women with disabilities is legal all around the globe, right? We have uh, no, no way to decide about our bodies. We have no remedy. We have no access to lawyers. We are talking about poverty, illiteracy, inequalities. Some of us get access, some of us don't get access due to this. We're facing oppression, oppression in the name of ableism that assumes that women with disabilities are not sexually active, should not be sexually active, should not have partners, should not engage and, or have a family life. And these perceptions are super, super harmful mm -hmm. because what it means is that we are excluded from services, Services are not accessible, sexual and reproductive health and rights are not accessible, information there is. When there is comprehensive, comprehensive sexual education available for women and girls, women and girls with disabilities are left out of the groups that are receiving that kind of information. So we are exposed, double exposed to violence, to gender-based violence, to unwanted pregnancies. We have no services. We are exposed to illnesses, sexually transmitted diseases mm -hmm. with no resource. So this is the situation that we face. And I think, and I wanted to go later into the solutions mm -hmm. and, and take about uh, funding, talk about funding. Perfect. This is the type of story that we want to hear because it puts the human face behind the data, the statistic in our reports that we share. And I like to say that people with disability, they have a special ability. And that's really how we need to frame that perspective. You've mentioned disparity in access, and it's a great transition to Dr. Dubey, who leads FP2030. I would love to hear your perspective when it comes to gaps, barriers, access to SRHR, and maybe more specifically, family planning. Thank you, thank you very much, and honored to be here and to my fellow panelists as well who are driving this agenda, and you could see from the conversations that this issue is a complex one. And I think I want to start with the macro issues that are sort of hindering access and they act as barriers. I recently came from Pakistan and there was a woman in one of these facilities who said she sneaked out of her house because she's not allowed to just be out there. And she wanted an, inject, an injection and because, so that no one knows what kind of family planning method she's going, she's using. And she said to me, and she was, you know, through interpretation, she said to me, you know, uh, we do this all the time, we pretend we are going out there, but we are never allowed, we are not allowed to actually use contraception. So this points to the issue of the social barriers. And I know what is easy to solve for us is the issue of women who say, I want it because we can meet that with supply. But what is harder is the fear that exists in the, in the community that an empowered woman, what are they going to do? Because, you know, let's control this because if we give them access, if we allow family planning to be normalized in communities, what will happen is the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have said at a granular level is the social barriers that exist for family planning. And this is all over the globe. You know, we see it everywhere. And I think social policy that says adolescents should not access family planning we in Senegal, where some youth were saying, we don't know what the imams are saying. We are having sex, but they do not have access. These are the social norms. We're all over the world. Women, are, they want family planning, but it becomes a taboo to mm -hmm. access family planning. So I think the biggest issue for us, and we are even 2023, we're talking about using women, we close and we open taps. Like when we want our policies to be pronatal, we open the tap. When we want to actually, in some countries today, they are talking mm -hmm. about you know, population control still. We close the tap. Women are not tools to be opened and to be closed. And I think once we actually understand that, we yes. will really- That is every round of applause, yes. Barriers. Thank you. <laughs> and a second one is the ossified leadership. And I, I'm saying ossified because I think that we can not divorce that sex should be fun, sex should be pleasurable, and you know when people are saying they are having it, why are we not making it safe? 
Why are we making it, not making it part of our population development policies? We want progress, and Anita, you are so right that we are, we are avoiding systems thinking, avoiding how to design facilities and even community health systems that actually make it conducive for women to access contraception. So health systems that are designed around primary health care that are integrated in their approach that consider financing around UHC will help us even go a long way. HIV programs have done that well, so there are not no HIV condoms and there are no family planning condoms. There's just one condom. And again, you know, we don't decide today you don't want HIV, but tomorrow you don't want pregnant to, to get pregnant. You don't, that's not how you make a decision. I believe that if family planning leaders and maternal health leaders uh -huh. don't work together, uh -huh. that will make the fissures and the cracks uh -huh. that already exist in these health systems to be widened further. Let us work together. And for me, that thing, systems thinking starts with us every day. Excellent, Thank you. excellent. Women are not a tool to be switched and open. And I think this perspective, I love to hear that because see, issues seem to be similar, even if there are some nuances whether we are in Africa, Asia, Europe, or even in America. And it really resonates with me because some of the research we conducted in, in West Africa, in Benin, and even in South, South, Southern US, issues are the same. In some part of the world, it's more social barriers. In other parts, it's more discrimination or cost-related barriers. So that's really exciting to hear, and we'll come back to that uh, later. Mrs. Okech. We talked before this plenary. We had a good conversation. Let me, let me hear and, and allow this August Assembly hear about your perspective when it comes to access, barriers, and solutions. Um, the narrative is very different when you talk about people who come from spaces which then access is a conversation had at political and very high level parliamentary spaces. I come from a space where we are looking at the issues of young women adolescent girls and women from rural communities mm -hmm. and peri-urban areas where these conversations are seen or heard on TV or if your political um, leader is benevolent enough to give you a small facility. So when you're looking at the issues of access, we are looking at the issues of where do these facilities exist, mm -hmm. who sits in those particular facilities, who when I walk in, if I am an LGBT person or an older woman with disability who just wants access to menopausal uh, reproductive health services that no one will question or no one will go back and tell my partner or my parent that this is what is happening. So if you are going to be looking at these issues, can we frame it and start thinking about those who are often left behind, mm. who never sit in these particular spaces? Can we think about those people who are in schools, when you're talking about sexual reproductive health rights for children, the right to information is in schools, from the primary school up to secondary school. Who gives this information when the curriculum in schools has removed anything to do with sexuality within the curriculum? So it is it is, means that our engagement must look at how then we look at social accountability where one, the community members themselves are able to engage. So that even government, which is right now ensuring that there are clampdowns, you're not talking, mm -hmm. religious fundamentalism is coming, where policies which were pro having information on sexual reproductive health and rights no longer exist, mm -hmm. but you hear preaching and information which is then being clamped down by political leaders. It means that the political policies override the rights which are enshrined in law. Mm. So if you're going to look at these particular issues, the pushback, we are back to the ground where we are saying as frontiers, that how then are we ensuring that our spaces remain open? How sure are we that then our social accountability tools within the spaces where we exist are open enough to have intersectional and intergenerational engagements for people from the different spaces and identities? and that you're not fearing that when you speak, the next time you'll be taken away 
and even imprisoned because uh -huh. there are new laws coming up which then make people fear to Absolutely. speak. And only that when you speak at maybe at this conference, then you're safe. Immediately you leave this conference, you might be in jail. Uh -huh. So if you are going to have those issues of social accountability, can we look at the legal frameworks? Can we look at the social frameworks where I can sit and speak about it? And then for me, I want to reclaim our own African family spaces where we had community spaces where we could speak where my grandmother in her seaweed day in Sakwa, Bondo, mm. would be able to sit with me and tell me about my body without shame. That is what we are looking at. And where boys would sit in their duels and mm. have men speaking. So then when I'm talking about male engagement, it is yeah. not a theoretical framework, but a framework in which it existed in our own cultural spaces mm. Mm. and our feminist power and voices can be heard by listening to our stories and speaking about our bodies without shame and speaking with it in a, a way in which it is free at different levels and not having laws then being put to give me a voice. It is already there. That's powerful. Let's push the pushback and let's remove shame from the conversation. That's your strong call of action. And of course, through a strong feminist lens. I know we, we now want to talk about some of those barriers, we have identified them, we identified the gaps, we have identified some solutions, but we need resources to make this change happen. And Dr. Saidi mentioned briefly some of the financial gaps that are currently existing. And it's a good transition for me to build on to come to Dr. Zelalem. So as, as a member of parliament, but also technical expert in public health, can you share with us some innovative financing mechanism that exists, or that can be existing, to share and ensure access to SRHR for all? Thank you very much to my fellow colleague, Dr. Jo, and uh, it is really an honor to be here in this high-level panel with the presence of you know, high-level delegates and panelists and distinguished audience in person and virtual. Um, before I jump into the financial scheme, you know it, my country is, is like showing up huge success in terms of addressing the need of SRH for you know, adolescent, young people, women and children. You can really Google how Ethiopia was really advancing reaching the MEDG target and now recently for the last 20 years you know there was analysis has been done by the inter-UN agency. Ethiopia is in a very good track to you know ramp down the ending you know the preventable maternal mortality. Of course we do for neonatal mortality, stillbirth and child mortality and addressing the need of young people you know women and uh, girls in terms of SRH. So we have a very good landscape in terms of policy, constitution, health transformation, you know, strategy, and also, you know, all the investments that we have for the health system. So, success wouldn't be without challenge. Uh -huh. So, the recent challenge, my excellency, a woman president, Madam President, yesterday, she showed up how we were really facing the challenge for the last couple of years in terms of climate change, uh -huh. and also, you know, conflicts and pandemic. You know, we try to absorb the shock and mitigate to continue the SRH service, even in the development and humanitarian and peace nexus. That's a part and a parcel of, you know, the activities that we are doing. So with this, of course, there is a financial gap uh -huh. because COVID really demanding, was demanding huge resource. And also, you know, we were also overstretched. The health system has been overstretched by COVID. You know, and also conflict and mm -hmm. also climate change, including the huge droughts that we did face for the last few years. So for that, you know, the government is proactively working in a very good manner, in a way that coordinating every actor in mm -hmm. this area ecosystem. You know, we coordinate the donor ecosystem and also the partners, civil society organizations and academia. So with that, our recent advancement is you know, you know, the funding for SRH from the Treasury was not as much as we expect. But for the last three to four years, my government is really committed to advance the Treasury funding from the tax revenue. And we have also pool funding mm -hmm. that everyone is contributing the donor. So we have channel one, channel two. You know, this is a big, you know, you know uh, commitment that we have. So the recent 
increment of the, from the treasuries is exemplary. So I can say the recent additional advancement is uh, we already signed a compact agreement with UNFP, which a kind of co-financing scheme to ensure a placement of the family planning commodities and supplies. The recent, which we are signing this week, by officially by the government of Ethiopia with the Minister of Finance and Minister of Health, that my excellency ministry is, is leading that. Mm -hmm. We have already signed an agreement with co-financing with donors and also with the government. That's also financing a scheme, a co-financing. Let me pause here to you know, convey my sincere gratitude for the donors mm -hmm. who has signed, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I think this is what I would like to share. Uh, let me come back if there is yeah, any question. Definitely, definitely. And we are excited to see the work that your country is achieving. And indeed, uh, President Saleh really reiterated yesterday her strong commitment to gender equality and women's health, of course, alongside her colleague, President Maki Saleh and President Kagame. And this is also a key issue when we talk about financing and investing in women's health. I want to come to Mr. Kevin Ali from Organon. Your organization is one of the women's, leading, women's health leading company in the world. So tell us, how can we find more innovative ways to fund these critical issues? Well, thank you for the introduction, and, and, uh, and I loved especially the he for she. That, that's something that's gonna stick with me for a while. So that, I, and it's a, it's a good point, because it says that it's a team sport. It, it cannot be just women supporting for women's causes, women's health issues. It has to be all voices oh. that are supporting this. And, and, and the issue about trying to find ways of being able to uh, invest in women's health oh is something that, um, as a new company, we are, in, in my interactions with governments around the world, uh, the thing that is common in almost every government, whether low middle income countries to um, you know, very developed countries, almost every government has something in their platform uh -huh. around women's health. The issue, though, is how to actually invest in it when the pandemic has created such an amazing amount of tension and pressure in terms of budgets around the world. Uh, and so the issue, though, is I think it comes back to sustainable finance. Sustainable finance is something that's been around for many, many years. Um, it has been really a, a, a multi kind of factorial in the sense that it has been focused on the green economy. But now, I mean, there are trillions of dollars out there. And really, the aim of sustainable finance is to invest in some things that can actually have societal impact. And the societal impact that we talk about for women's health are clear. Let's look at a couple of things that we're talking about, so sexual and reproductive health. Unintended pregnancies. Uh -huh. Unintended pregnancies that 50%, which means half of all pregnancies were not meant to be, can derail a young child, a woman, from her educational path, from her career path, because she now has to focus on taking care of a family that she did not intend to actually have in the first place. So unintended pregnancies, why has it been at 50%? What needs to be done in order to be able to lower the unintended pregnancy rates so that we allow more girls, more young women, to, in order to follow their career path, their education path, a number of other things? Governments understand this, but there needs to be financing. And so that's where sustainable financing comes in. It's, it's, a, it's, it's right now uh, the beginning phase uh -huh. of really investing in that space. It is, it's a co correlation between governments, NGOs, investors, banks, uh -huh. private industry, civil society that comes together to solve some of these issues, like, for example, unintended pregnancies. There are trillions of dollars in the green economy. Now we're trying to create more of a movement and a focus on trying to invest in women's health issues. We ourselves at Organon have arrangement recently signed with COF, which is the Latin American Development Bank, uh, to work with different countries to see what, what can be done to support education, more education, access, more things like, for example, free contraception, and a number of other things that can help to solve, to reduce the burden of unintended pregnancies. Because one thing we know, which is that healthy women equals healthy society, equals healthy economy. We need to look at this from a very financial point of view. 
from a financial lens. A healthier society, specifically a healthier women in that society can create significant upgrades in terms of overall GDP growth. So I believe sustainable finance, those funds that are there, there is more and more news, there's more kind of, it's nascent, it's just beginning, but that's where more funds can be dedicated to governments that have specific projects. These have to be tangible, specific, me measurable projects that can ultimately lead to a betterment uh, in, in society. And I think that's the way that we go forward in terms of being able to provide more financing so that more things can be done that ultimately can be measured and ultimately lead to a better situation for women's health. Mm. That's interesting because I think we need to really accelerate everything going in terms of mobilizing resources and financing. You pointed out very well, we have a green economy, blue economy. Maybe this is the time to create our own pink economy for women's health, why not? That's something we should think about as a society and as a group. So thank you for making this commitment and I would really love as a next round to hear from where and how can we really mobilize those resources? And I will come back to you on that. Coming back to another rights-based perspective, I've asked the question to other speakers and I would love to hear from our distinguished speakers as well on how can rights-based framing strengthen SRH advocacy and gender equality. And if at some point you have already answered that question, you can give us some specific or successful example. Let me start with Dr. Dubé. You know, when we talk about rights, uh, first, I think it's just the need for us to commit to holding each other accountable around the fact that rights are indivisible. We cannot divide them because we want to protect either power or we want to preserve our positions or because we do not want to rattle the board. So because we are in this situation around rights across the world, we need to be bolder and we need not hold back. In fact, I think we need to double down, especially when it comes to rights. You know, we have watched over the years, when it starts with LGBTQ rights, we are like, oh, it's them who are working on that issue. It's not going to touch my turf. When it comes to abortion rights, we are like, yeah, you know, they must be more organized. It, it's not touching my turf. But you know what? Next, they are coming for the very work that you do. And we are all being pushed mm -hmm. into a prison. And when we are in a prison, as we always say, you can only revolt and be grateful that you are given porridge mm -hmm. in a prison. There is no revolution. So the revolution that you want to see in women's health is not going to happen when we are all like annihilated from exercising and claiming our rights. And I think that message for me is important. But we are seeing in Uganda, we are seeing in Malawi, we are seeing in Ghana, we are seeing all over the, the world, even in the United States, we are seeing those issues of, of rights being annihilated. But where rights and freedom of expression and bodily autonomy is exercised. We have seen women thrive and economies actually develop. And that's why for me it's important as for us to double down. But I want to touch on a last point. There are no rights without access. Mm -hmm. So we can't talk about rights when there is no access. We need to meet this demand that we are seeing. In some places it's suppressed demand. We need to meet it with access. Access to commodities, access to voices, access to services, quality services for women across the world. We will see results in maternal mortality reduction, in uh, women's health overall. But what Kevin mentioned, GDPs mm -hmm. rising. Mm -hmm. Right now we are suppressing GDPs in homes because we do not want women to exercise bodily autonomy and rights. And Excellent. a rights-based approach, Joanna, everywhere, for everyone, it's important because everyone deserves that access. It's not about size of population or not. It's be, it, it's, it should be free of coercion, free of provider bias, and more importantly, free of threats to women's safety. And I think that's important. Everyone deserves access, and it is a human right. Mrs. Catalina, how can rights-based framing strengthen our work? Now, thank you very much. And I couldn't uh, 
agree more with this idea of how we have been siloed on identity politics that have been the worst of the worst for us. But how do we approach a human rights-based approach is through participation. We live all in the margins of a cycle of society that was created by others, not by us. Now we have to create a bigger cycle in which all of us can participate. But to do that, to be really, we really need to embrace diversity. We really need to bring intentionally do outreach to bring those that are the most marginalized. No solution is going to be sustainable unless it's not participatory. And for that, we need to invest mm -hmm. in resourcing accessibility for those that need accessibility, access to participate, access to have services. There is no human rights-based approach that will fit all. We really need to be as generic as possible and as specific as possible. But I want to touch on two more points. First is we will not advance, and that goes to the first point, without solidarity and without cross-movement learning. We are ready as a disability feminist movement to engage and open to learn, eager to learn from the bigger feminist movement. Our narratives can help open many doors, doors that are now closed due to the backlash, to the crisis, the climate crisis. We, have, we are facing this enormous global crisis. We are not going to advance if we don't do it together, and we should be working and finding ways of working together, defining new narratives to be able to advance. Oh. And the last thing is sustainable financing. I just want to give you an example, or finances in general. In 2019, only one billion dollars, only one billion dollars was devoted to gender and rights mm -hmm. in the US philanthropic sphere. From that one billion dollar that is already no money, only 6.5 million, 6.5 million were devoted to women and girls with disabilities. That's not the way in which we will advance. We really need to be intentional in the outreach. We really need to be working all together to make sure that we transform the society for all. But without every single person, without indigenous women, without older women, without women with disabilities, without girls in rural areas, we are not going to advance. And that means intentional changes in the financing. Perfect. Thank you. Solidarity, intentionality, and smart investment. Mrs. Okech. Um, for me, I say design with me, through me, and not for me. Uh, because one of the things we have heard in the systems is that there is always a push method. We want the health systems to ensure that it's my right to pull what I want within each facility. So for example, when you're looking at, looking at the sexual reproductive health rights of trans people in some rural community, what commodities do they have for the hormonal needs that they have within that rural community in that facility, which is supposed to be free and accessible? So when we are looking at those particular issues of the rights, the, the intersectional designing of how commodities reach communities is something which is very important. And how to finance those commodities to reach communities whenever they want and wherever they want is something which is, can be innovative. Because for one, we are saying now there's a company called Zipline, which can drop commodities to where you are. How come then when we are looking at commodities which I want, in my particular island, wherever I am, that I, it is not available in the pharmacies because it has to be gotten from, for example, in Kenya, only in Nairobi, in a private hospital. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at it, is that public health facilities, which is embedded in the primary health care system, must ensure that commodities are available at the lowest health unit. So when we are designing all this, it is my right, my right to health is enshrined in our constitutions, mm -hmm. and it cannot be sectionalized, that this is the type of right which you will have, and for you know, because you come from this particular space, you will have to wait. And it is my right to have the issues of health workers' rights, that within even the spaces where we work, how many health workers do we have of different cadres who are able to then ensure that whenever I go to the hospital, whether if it's at night and I'm a pregnant woman, for example, and has a complication, that health facility must have even an operating theater with a, a surgeon who can be able to give me access to rights. Absolutely. So that is something which we need to look at, that in designing health systems, are those things enshrined not just as a constitutional paper where we are going to be discussing, but that for me, service delivery is a right. 
and quality health service, not just service. Thank you. Awesome. Perfectly well said. Perfectly well said. And we talked about barriers. We talked about gaps. We talked about financing. We talked about how can we strategize. Now let's talk about how can we collaborate, because this is a human rights issue. Like Mr. Ali said, it's not just a women issue. It's a societal issue. So how can we really build on cross-sector collaboration and partnership to reach our goal? There is power in number. There is power in partnership. Let me come to Mr. Ali. How can we collaborate more strategically together, bringing the private sector know-how, foundation, government, civil society, academia? Please tell us. Well, I, I can tell you that all of us here play our role in the pursuit of women's health. Um, but my view, my focus, first and foremost, is how do we bring more innovation in research and development to women around the world? If I start to throw some examples to you, more than a decade ago, uh, development of human papillomavirus vaccine was, was designed and developed and rolled out. Do you know that now it turned cervical cancer from the fourth leading cause of cancer for women to now the WHO stating that they see a future of elimination of cervical cancer for women due to HPV. Mm -hmm. That is just one example. If I give you other examples, breast cancer. Breast cancer in England 30 years ago, um, in those 30 years, they've been able to reduce the number of deaths due to breast cancer by almost two thirds. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example, hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is something that used to take very expensive products, interferon, for almost a year of therapy, and you would have a 50% success rate. Now you can do it in six weeks with a 90% success rate. These are just examples. But as we start to pivot for the future and thinking about collaboration and partnerships, to your point, Joanny, the issue is how do we now solve the issues of things like preterm labor, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, endometriosis, preeclampsia, mm -hmm. postmenopausal vasomotor symptoms. These are just the tip of the iceberg. And that was the reason of the birth of Organon. Organon is the company that I lead. The, the reason that we were born is because there's too little investment in research and development dollars. 4% of all R&D spending was spent last year and the years before mm -hmm. on focused on women's health related issues. And we thought it's time now for a company to come through and ultimately invest in women's health solutions because innovation mm. by itself is not good enough. No one company, no one government, no one group can solve some of these intractable issues. It takes a community. Mm -hmm. All the voices has to be raised. And those voices has to be raised in a focus of positivity. We talked about the fact that these issues have been going on for centuries. To, to a large degree in terms of the issues around women's health. Now is the time, I believe, as it all collates and coalesces together. Voices of women are stronger than ever before. Governments are starting to listen. As I told you, mm. when I go to governments, every government has something in their platform to deal with women's health. Financing is available. We need to do more. It's just the beginning. R&D needs to come through. Mm. R&D is the way that we can solve some of these issues We've actually now have a multitude of number of projects that are in the way mm. that is, is actually going to solve some of these issues. And I'm very proud of Organon's partnerships. We have a partnership with Dr. Zaidi with regards to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have a partnership with Dr. Kanem for the UNFPA. We have a partnership with Dr. Samu with FP2030. All of these partnerships are aimed at women's health and improving women's health in the low and middle income countries, specifically 73 Perfect. countries. That's what we're invested to do, but it is only a part of the whole issue in the sense that innovation in itself is not good enough. We need to create uh -huh. access. We need to make sure there's education uh -huh. because HPV vaccines have been around for more than a decade, but only now are being taken up globally. And only now that the WHO is saying those kind of things. So when I'm signaling to you that I see a future I wish, I hope, I pray for a future whereby um, we don't have a 50% unintended pregnancy rate so that a woman, when she decides to start a family, it's her decision to do so. And if she decides to pursue her career, pursue education, can choose to do so. We Absolutely. don't have 
a situation where, for example, 10% of all women who suffer from the debilitation yeah. of endometriosis, we have medicines for that that can, uh, uh, the innovations for that that can talk, can deal with that. We don't have things like, for example, preeclampsia. I was just moved recently with Tori uh, Bowie, who is essentially a, a champion U.S. Olympic sprinter who just died recently, a young woman from the complications of childbirth due to preeclampsia because there was nothing there available for her. We need to solve some of these issues. And through these partnerships and through the financing and through more companies, it cannot be Oregon on alone, yeah. more companies ultimately investing, we can make some change in this area. Absolutely. Community-owned innovation, R&D, is the way. Uh, let me hear a quick comment from Dr. Zaidi. So just following up from what Kevin said, which was all fantastic, and, and I completely agree, R&D partnerships, R&D in women's health is very, very neglected, and R&D partnerships are crucial to really change this. But I want to talk about another kind of partnership, which I have been so impressed by, which is the partnership that countries are making amongst themselves to advance their own uh, priorities in family planning, like the Vagadogu partnership, right? the West African partnership, which has really uh, been a game changer in how they're making uh, uh, contraception accessible to women who want it. Another kind of partnership is the FP2030 partnership that Dr. Samu Dube represents, and maybe she can talk about it a little bit. Other types of partnerships are funding partnerships, mm -hmm. like funders coming together and saying, hey, we really want to do this. Let's get together. Let's see how we can leverage each other's resources and make the whole bigger than the sum of the parts. So for example, BMGF works with uh, uh, the Children's Investment Fund um, uh, in um, making uh, 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 DMPA SC, the subcutaneous injection, uh -huh. available to more women. Okay. And now are we, we are investing in making generic so that more product is available in countries around the world. So there are all kinds of partnerships, advocacy partnerships, country partnerships, public-private partnerships, funding partnerships that are needed to really advance women's health. And I love the way you disaggregate that because we want to have partnership technically, financially, strategically, and all this needs to come together in a very cohesive way. And yes, you pointed out key partnership, FP 2030, but also Le Partenariat de Ouagadougou, doing an amazing job in, in Africa. Dr. Zelalem, coming back to you, okay, and we we'll thank Dr. Zaidi who has another urgent commitment, and we appreciate her participation. Dr. Zelalem, representative of a government and technical expert. Partnership, collaboration, coalition, what's your take on that? Thank you very much. This is what, what I'm really here, you know. This is one of the showcases how we, the world is, you know, connected, how the partnership and collaboration really matters. It would have been not possible if there was no any partnership. This event went were not supposed to be happened. So this will be a showcase. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the government, I think uh, we are continuing ensuring it's all about government leadership. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever the case we have, we need to be in a position to coordinate efficiently. You know? So it needs efficiency. We need to elevate how much we are really efficient. And we have to ensure that government is leading the mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and also joining the forces, taking the driver's seat. So that's one. So we have partnership with the donor ecosystem, including BMGF and other organizations. And also we have a very important connection with the UN system, including UNFP, when something comes to SRH, adolescent, you know, women health and young people. I'm also excited to see my sister, Dr. Dube. We have also already signed, you know, among the few countries, Ethiopia was the top on the list to sign the FP2030, which, which is a very high level commitment. So we will just continue the collaboration and the partnership, not only with the headquarters, but also with the Eastern and South Africa regional office hub. And also we'll continue, you know, the advocacy and um, bringing the CESOS, Academia Research, you know, Institute, because this collaboration really matters. So for me, I will definitely say that we will continue ensuring our policies and strategies are really implemented very well. Mm -hmm. And this definitely benefits, you know, our people, specifically the big domain, women, adolescent, and, you know, young people. We'll continue ensuring efficiency of collaboration, coordinating, coordination, and also 
we have to ensure that you know the service is in place. Even oftentimes, can be humanitarian or development. We have to ensure that we connect the three nexus: peace, humanitarian, and development nexus. For me, SRH is I can say with my last word perhaps. It's beyond hills. It's all about the development and the prosperity agenda for my country. Let us continue the dialogue, continue you know, the discussion about women and young people and girls. This, that's our business, looking forward to the bigger picture SDGs to sustain the gain as well. Thank you very much, my sister, Dr. Joy. Perfect. This was a good way to close this uh, panel, which was quite exciting. We talked about working together technical, financial, strategic partnership. We talk about engaging community and making sure that community-owned R&D is the way. We talk about right, right-based framing, but also we committed on this panel and in the audience that the next time we will meet, we will have enough mechanism to end, to end the challenges that girls, women, and all are facing when it comes to SRHR and bodily autonomy. I'm Joanne Bewa, and this was panel one on SRHR and bodily autonomy. Thank you, distinguished speakers, and we appreciate your perspective. Yes, my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. This was, thank you so much, distinguished speaker. We are excited, we are thrilled, we are honored. And this is not the end. This is uh, the end of the conversation, but it's not the end of the plenary. We do have a key announcement coming up right after this panel. And I'm always excited about announcements. And I hope you two are. while the team is helping for the stage. I would like to hear some energy from the room. Can I have some energy from the room? Can I please have some energy from the room? Okay, let's wave our hands from the left to the right. Let's start here. We wave here. Can we wave there? And just follow my hand. Just follow my hand. Just follow my hand. Can we wave here? Can we wave here? Perfect. All right. So as you know, Canada is a champion for SIHR and bodily autonomy. Canada is also a champion for gender equality. And I had the opportunity in 2017 to share with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau himself that the world is watching Canada and is learning from Canada's exceptional leadership. So today we have an announcement from Government of Canada. I have the pleasure and the honor, the tremendous task and huge responsibility to invite the Honorable Minister, Mr. R.D. Sajan, who is the Minister of International Development for the Government of Canada. He was first elected as Member of Parliament for Vancouver South in 2015 and served as well as Minister of National Defence from 2015 to 2021. He will be followed by an activist, Viviano K from Plan International. Please, let's welcome them on stage with the round of applause. <laughs> Honourable Minister Arjit Sajan. Welcome, Honorable. Our pleasure. Whoa. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I just want to say what a great privilege it is for me to be in this room with all of you. And I sincerely mean this. It is, you are absolutely inspiring. And um, I, I am also learning uh, lots uh, as I'm uh, as one of your champions as well. So as everyone in this room understands, access to comprehensive SRHR is absolutely critical. It is critical for advancing health, gender equality, and especially human rights. And it is key to unlocking progress and maintaining our SDGs. And frankly, it is also just the right thing to do. 
So my time as Minister of International Development, I had the chance to see the progress in action. I've had the chance to speak with people who have described the impact that our work has made in their lives. So for example, earlier this year in a center run by women refugees in Jordan, I spoke with a group of adolescents about the power they feel in finding their own voice. And in Lebanon, I met with a group of male peer champions and heard about how they are involved in advocating for gender equality. And for me, this drives home the importance of this work. All of us need to counter the growing global backlash against women's rights and including SRHR. We must rise up for women's bodily autonomy, including their right to have an abortion and access to safe abortion and post-abortion care. And yes, I'm very proud to say this openly. It is important that each of us stand up and be unwavering in our commitment. It has already been four years since our, uh, uh, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, committed to increase Canada's global health funding to reach an average of $1.4 billion annually. And half of this commitment is dedicated to SRHR. And Canada is on track to hit this ambitious target of investing $700 million in comprehensive SRHR every single year. So today, I am announcing more than $200 million in new projects that will be going to that will be going to our She Soars initiative. Now say this with me, She Soars. Uh, it's a tongue twister, but it's an important one. So as part of this new initiative, this is very important as well, 50% of our SRHR commitment will go towards neglected areas starting next year. Now, now these areas of family planning, Comprehensive sexual, sexuality education, advocacy for SRHR, safe abortion, post-abortion care, and sexual and gender-based violence. For the next seven years, the Seashores Initiative will focus on three areas. First, advancing sexual and reproductive health services, particularly in, neglect, in neglected areas that I just mentioned. Second, protecting SRHR, SRHR in fragile contexts. And third, standing up and advocating for SRHR at all levels, like what I'm doing right now. This will advance comprehensive global and regional and country-led SRHR uh, priorities. Now, as we know that no woman should be forced to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term, and no woman should die because of pregnancy or childbirth. Access to safe and legal abortion and post-abortion care allows women to determine their own futures. So we are crystal clear in our belief that every woman everywhere has the right to safe and legal abortions. Every woman everywhere has the right to maternal health care. And every woman everywhere has the right to comprehensive sexuality education and contraception. And we cannot politicize what is simply the right thing to do for women and for our, all our communities. So I want to take this moment also to take this opportunity because it's important. I'm getting old. As you can say by the gray beards, we need to hear from our future leaders. And I had the privilege to talk to a future leader. Her name is Vivian Oke. She's from Benin. She is a, a, a doctoral medical student who's 22 years old, who's an ardent fe uh, feminist and also defender of girls and women's rights everywhere. She has also created a mobile app for women to track the menstrual cycle and prevent cancer and also to get the health information that, that, that they need. She is also the first woman to be elected to head her own medical students association. So I also wanna say, when I met her, she came up to me and said, and asked me a question. She said, can I ask you a question? Why do you support gender equality? Now, it's an odd question in this forum, but I'm glad she actually had the courage to come up because how many times have, have you heard, have they heard somebody says, listen, I support you, but they don't? And I, had to, I answered that question. I said, one, I wanna thank you uh, for uh, asking that question. 
Because one, I was raised as a feminist, and two, I believe in gender equality because for us to reach our, uh, um, our uh, sustainable development goals, we need to take a feminist force. We need to focus on gender equality, and we will not be unapologetic in this regard. So it is my privilege to cede this podium to my very good friend, Vivian. I will start by sharing a personal story. I was once in a shift in hospital and we received Grace, a 21 young Beninese woman. She came complaining about stomach pain. When we were touching her, she didn't even want and told us that it was just a digestive pain. And we realized that her parameters, her blood pressure was becoming more and more low. And we were sure that girl was bleeding from somewhere. I took her apart and I asked her, did you perform an unsafe abortion? She told me yes. And we started running to get blood in order to save her life. We ran and we were able to save her life through a safe abortion process. <laughs> the story of Grace is the one of 25 million women all over the world performing unsafe abortion and that mostly finish with disabilities or die. No woman deserves to die because of a choice she made on her own body. <laughs> Safe abortion is a health care. Safe abortion is a health right, and safe abortion is a human right. And that is why we've been advocating for this. We've been working with Plan International and all other partners like Canada's Affairs that are helping us. Thank you. inspiring? Isn't this inspiring? Isn't this inspiring? Thanks, Minister, for the strong commitment on behalf of Canadian government. Canada never disappoints, and we are excited and thrilled to see Canada leading the way. But also thanks to our dear Vivian, Vivian O'K, a passionate, talented, and inspiring young leader from Benin Republic my own country of origin, who is breaking barriers. We are proud to see young generation advocating, working, pushing the lines, and making access, safe access for all, a reality. So we are now transitioning to the next and the last segment of this plenary. This segment is a quick, Parasite chat conversation on abortion right. In my teenage year, I had a best friend who performed an abortion. She was around 15 years old. But she didn't feel any of the demographic that we know. She was not uneducated. She was not vulnerable socially. She was coming from a two parent household community. But still, she performed an abortion and she died from it. So this is a really important topic for us to discuss about. Personally, for me, not because of that personal experience, 
but also for the patients that I receive in my clinical practice, for the organization that advise on policies and programs. I now have the pleasure to invite on stage our distinguished speakers who will be leading this fireside chat conversation with me. Welcome on stage, distinguished speakers. They want to hear from you. They do want to hear from you. They absolutely want to hear from you. <laughs> Dr. Angela Ako, Mrs. Ana Cristina Gonzalez Velez, Dr. Velez, Mrs. Nancy Northrop, Mrs. Rusha Charlies. Welcome on stage. How do you feel, ladies? Can you feel the energy in the room? Can we feel the energy in the room? So like I was introducing before, this is a very exciting uh, for a chat conversation on abortion right. I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Angela Akol, director of IPAS Africa Alliance. She has decades of experiences in HIV, AIDS, SRHR, and family planning. <laughs> Dr. Ana Cristina Gonzalez Viles, founder of Causa Justa, international researcher, advocate for SRHR, and former national public health director in Colombia. <laughs> Mrs. Nancy Nottop, president and CEO of the Center for Reproductive Rights. Under her leadership, the center's litigation and activism has transformed how courts, governments, and bodies understand reproductive rights. Welcome, Ms. Nartop. <laughs> and Mrs. Verusha Chalice, project officer at Beyond Beijing, a women's rights and gender equality organization. She's passionate about women's health, gender equality, and she brings a key perspective on comprehensive access to SIHR, including safe abortion. Welcome on stage. <laughs> so let me start with Dr. Ako. Um, I would love to hear uh, through the work that you're doing as director of IPAS Africa, what are some of the challenges that you and your organization face when it comes to advocating for abortion right, including reproductive health and rights, and what are some solutions that you can share with the audience? You know, Joanne, this year, 35 million women will die from the consequences of unsafe abortion, and that is really unfortunate, because this is the year in which we celebrate 20 years of the Maputo Protocol, which gave us a framework for promoting women's reproductive rights in Africa. Most of those deaths will be in low resource settings like Africa. This is also the year in which we celebrate 50 years of IPAS. IPAS having been born on the back of challenges to reproductive rights and abortion access. Mm -hmm. So the challenges are multiple, and uh, many of them stem from policy. I'll call out one piece of policy legislation that we find through our work as being particularly um, exacerbating of uh, the situation that we see. U.S. foreign policy through the Helms Amendment does exacerbate unsafe abortion or it does limit access to sexual reproductive health and rights, safe abortion care in low resource settings. And this is because, you know, the, the letter of the amendment says that you cannot use U.S. foreign assistance for abortion as a family planning method. Now that ambiguity around the framing and its interpretation really ties the hands of providers and implementers because they do not want to run foul of their funder. And this really limits access even in settings where abortion is legal. So that is one piece of legislation that I will call out as a hindrance. Mm. The other one, and again another anniversary last year, the US Supreme Court um, overturned Roe versus Wade, which we all know. And we have seen this um, pronouncement or this overturning as one that has supercharged anti-rights movements. And we've seen deteriorations within Africa as a consequence. I will end with the anti-rights movements. That is a huge challenge that we are seeing. And um, the um, anti-rights anti movements are groups that are anti-feminist, anti-rights. They, they, they are rooted in patriarchy mm -hmm. and they limit um, our conversations and our interactions with, with populations around abortion access. And make no mistake, mm. it is not only abortion and contraception, because rights are interconnected. 
Last May, this year, the Uganda government passed a very harsh anti-LGBTQ law, and we're seeing a potential wave of similar laws across the continent. These are deep, deep challenges that we must all address. Mm -hmm. Finally, there is a call on us as a solution to be super vigilant, because we may think that these challenges stem from politicians, but we recognize that very often those challenges are within our own community. Um, and just allow me to say this, we know women deliver as a space through which we advocates and actors have always been free to share strategies and, and, and share knowledge. But if we see women deliver being penetrated by people who have espoused anti-rights opinions, then we become part of the problem. I'll, I'll just end it at that. that Thank you, Joanne. That's a strong point, Dr. Colin. And I'm hearing a lot of, not just challenges, but I'm hearing hopes, I'm hearing solutions here. And, and I would love to hear the same perspective, but more from a Latin American perspective, coming to Dr. Gonzalez Velez. How does you and Causa Justa support abortion rights in your country and other Latin American countries? Thank you so much. I think I have to start saying that this Causa Justa movement, uh, Just Cause, as you call it, arrived upon the scene in Colombia in February 2020, just before the pandemic, but after three years of internal work and more than 25 years uh, after La Mesa por la Vida y la Salud de las Mujeres, a feminist group where this movement was born, was created. Uh, we emerge with the idea of engaging the country in a respectful public debate criticizing the use of criminal law as a way of regulating abortion, leading to a change in the paradigm in how societies regulate socially and legally abortion. Mm -hmm. That same year, and after 523 days, the Constitutional Court decided our legal claim, decriminalizing abortion up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. A core decision that placed us in the vanguard of Latin America and the Caribbean with one of the most protective regulations regarding abortion globally. Mm. And from there, I can say at least these things. First, pursue your case, your cause, sorry, no matter if there are ideal opportunities or small windows of opportunities. Transform your cause into a movement with the involvement and participation of diverse groups of women, youth, feminists, human rights activists, academics, and media, uh, medical associations, among others, all over the country, and not just with groups from the capital. Without a doubt, the Causa Justa movement resulted from the political accumulation of national feminism and the wide involvement of all these organizations which provided us with legitimacy and credibility, mm -hmm. but also from working with public opinion leaders, politicians and journalists. Create and advance a public conversation about abortion in your own terms, based on your own arguments. And finally, designing an integral strategy that in addition to those arguments and the legal uh, actions summed up in our case in the suit, includes educational work with different audiences, social mobilization constructed on the base mm. of three pillars, which, in, which are political communications with traditional mass media and digital outlets, social media and street protests, among others. Oh. And finally, keep your goal until the end, no matter how much you get pressure. Building a cohesive and wide movement. Thank you. Well said. Mobilize, transform, act, no matter what resistance, no matter what issues uh, are actually happening. Dr. Akol mentioned some of the conversation in the U.S. context, and this is a question from Mrs. Nortop, uh, doing fantastic work with the Center for Reproductive Rights. How might the conversation in the U.S., specifically U.S. abortion rights, impact other countries when it comes to assessing safe, legal abortion, but also SRHR? So, of course, when the Supreme Court case, the Dobbs case, came down, which is the case that reversed Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. huge concern about imp what impact that would have around the world. 
And I think it's important to note that the trend, I mean, the concern was that there has been a huge liberalization trend for the last 30 years. In fact, 60 countries have liberalized their abortion laws in the past 30 years. Only four countries have gone backwards, the United States, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Poland. Mm -hmm. So concern about what that impact would be. And of course, the anti-rights movement used every opportunity to try to use this to their advantage. And we saw that. We saw that in a case in Kenya, which the center and its partners are litigating. We saw it in Nigeria. But we also saw governments standing up and saying they are condemning this Supreme Court decision. And one of the colloquies that went on in mm -hmm. India mm -hmm. in a recent Supreme Court argument in the case on same-sex marriage in India, the government, one of the government lawyers tried to cite the Dobbs case and say, just like in Dobbs, we should not have this decided as a rights issue mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court of India. This should be decided by the parliament. And the chief justice in that colloquy said, don't cite Dobbs. We have gone far beyond Perfect. Dobbs. Okay. And, okay. you know, fortunately so, uh -huh. because we should take, you know, pride, paraphrasing here, but pride in the fact mm -hmm. that we are far ahead of Western countries. So, you know, this is an example of countries are saying, you know, mm -hmm. this doesn't apply to us. Mm -hmm. We're going our own way. Mm -hmm. I think also, you know, it's important to remember, and in, you know, the United States, uh, that we too have been standing up against this. It's important to remember that the Supreme Court's decision is not the policy of the United States government. Mm -hmm. It is the policy of the Biden administration to support abortion rights, both domestically and in its foreign policy, to the extent that the executive can, and Congress with the Hyde Amendment has limits there. It is not the policy of many of the state governments, mm -hmm. which protect the right to abortion, and in fact have gone beyond Dobbs to protect it even further. And it is not the position of the American public. A very recent Associated Press poll found that two-thirds of Americans support general access to abortion. So when we're talking about the Dobbs case and we're talking about the U.S. going backwards, it's important to be precise that that was a court decision. Some states are using it to detrimental effect, mm -hmm. but it's not the policy of the U.S. government. It's not the policy of many states, and it is absolutely not the position of the American people. Awesome. That's well said. That's well said and strongly said. And I think I've, I've witnessed some progressive support and mobilization while working in the southern part of, of the United States. And again, like you said, it's, it can be a court decision, but you know the community, the country, and people have their own position about this, this topic. And we do appreciate that. I'm coming to you, Mrs. Charlize, regarding your country, Nepal. Nepal got to the point where abortion is illegal, safe abortion is legal. Can you please share with us your country's experience, some strategies or some best practices, and even yourself as a leader, how you play the role in this work? Okay, so this was not the situation of Nepal uh, over two decades ago. So abortion was uh, criminalized and it, it still is criminalized, but Nepal has a, a remarkable journey in legalizing abortion, conditional abortion in some cases. And also uh, Nepal's government uh, has made a remarkable progress in ensuring women's autonomy over their reproductive health. And at the heart of this progress lies Nepal's uh, commitment to ensure that every woman, every girl, despite all their diversity, they need to have access to a reproductive safe uh, abortion and other reproductive health services. So uh, this was a legal reform that happened, which is a milestone in the context of Nepal. It happened when our country, uh, the, uh, the Nepal uh, 
introduced the National Code in 2002, legalizing conditional abortion, which was a, a reform in the context of safe abortion in Nepal. But uh, the legal reforms in itself uh, could not have stand uh, or uh, brought the change in the context of Nepal. It was the collective efforts of uh, women-led organizations, civil society organizations, and women-led movements uh, which made it to this point. So it was the so these movements, these activisms, they played a huge role in changing the policies that uh, prevented women from accessing abortion or other se sexual and reproductive health services. Yes. So the campaigns, the movements, they engaged various policymakers, change makers, uh, and even communities and. Uh, uh, spread awareness uh, about uh, sexual and reproductive health of women and how important it is for every individual to have uh, uh, autonomy over their own body. So, uh, yeah, uh, now we stand as a nation where the constitution of Nepal, it recognizes uh, and respects, it addresses uh, sexual and reproductive health of every woman in all their diversity in its constitution and also it has provisions to promote gender equality as well. So uh, to support the legal provisions, uh, Nepal has adopted a wider approach. It has integrated uh, sexual and reproductive health services in its national healthcare system, which has made it easier for uh, women who are seeking for safe abortion or uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, services to access those services through the facilities where trained health professionals are, uh, are stationed all over the country. So uh, these uh, practices are there to tackle the abortion stigma because various awareness activities are uh, promoted through these uh, initiatives, these programs, and it also uh, aims to reduce uh, unsafe abortions, maternal mortalities, which comes attached, when, uh, which comes attached to uh, the provisions where women and girls, they do not have access to uh, abortion or sexual and reproductive health services. Okay. And to further uh, create an enabling environment, what uh, the government has uh, recently done is uh, acknowledging the socioeconomic barriers that could have impacted an individual's access to uh, reproductive health, especially in terms of safe abortion. It has, uh, it has, a free pro it has uh, considered a free provision of a safe abortion through all the government health facilities across the country. All right. So that is a, a remarkable progress that yeah. Nepal government has made the commitment of uh, government to make a reform and to address the sexual and reproductive health of uh, women. But despite the progress made, we still have a very long way to go. There are still challenges where uh, women, uh, especially young women who cannot have access to uh, these services because of the existing social stigmas, taboos, which is creating a great barrier and challenge for young unmarried women, uh, person with uh, diverse sexual identities and person with disabilities to access safe abortion services. So yes, and we, we can, have uh, made progress, but there still is a very long way for us to go perfect. in terms of advocacy. Yeah. We can definitely come back to that, and I would love to hear more about your perspective. Thank you for making such a strong case about Nepal legal reform, but also you pointed out the importance of addressing social determinant of health, social economic barrier. You also focused on social stigma. And that's a good transition for me to go to Dr. Velez. How can we challenge and change societal stigma around abortion? Imagine you wake up and there is a state prohibition for having children. And now imagine there is a law forcing women to have those children. And that's what we are talking about here. And we need to change our messages and avoid self-censorship and pursuing a change in the paradigm on how we are regulating abortion mm. and trying to eliminate the crime of abortion everywhere from the penal codes. No crime, more legitimacy, less stigma. 
Also, understanding and envisioning the challenges to be faced immediately after a win, which embraces the implementation of those decisions or laws, mm -hmm. including the provision of services within the health systems, as she already mentioned, but also the creation of conditions for self-induced abortion, and also the protection of legal decisions, um, including legal threats, like the attempts of annulments or uh, referendums that try to challenge acquired rights, but also protect human rights defenders in this field. Mm -hmm. And most than that, enforcing the political protection of those advancements that needs to be safeguarded from political fallout, as politicians in general do not understand the society, that the society has changed. Recent polls uh, carried out in Colombia shown dramatic changes in public opinion since 2022. 92%, 92% of the population believes pregnancies cannot be forced and considers women's decisions over their reproduction have to be respected without the interference of the state or the church. And finally, work on social decriminalization. Listen, history goes forward, mm. and conquers of full right for women has grown in the last centuries with ups and downs, uh, to be certain. And because of this, the resistance from male dominant patriarchy also becomes fierce, even violent, and dangerous. Our freedom is the cultural battle of this century. And that's why we need to continue supporting the movements and what they have built and the methods they have built, like the one that Causa Justo deployed in recent years, a political method to advance difficult or polarizing conversations, a method based on the ideas, public argumentation, peaceful demonstrations, on the construction of dialogues in regions among different actors with diverse groups among diverse people. Mm a method that based on the transparency of ideas and arguments expressed aloud publicly and honestly generates trust. A trust that allows dialogues to be open and change to be brought about. Therefore, not keeping silent is our greatest defense, our most powerful weapon. Know that does, that, that takes lives, but instead serves to recover dignity and to give women spaces to exist as they dream, to change the minds and hearts of people, of more and more people will be the safeguard of our freedom. You said it all, you said it all, Dr. Velez. We shall not stay silent, that's what you said. And we should not stay silent. We need to be vocal, and that's our best defense. And I think it's similar to the call that Minister Sargent said. We need to stand for SIHR. We need to stand for women. We need to make sure that they succeed, they thrive, and they source. Let me come back to Mrs. Norton. And make sure that the audience here hear your perspective about how can we collaborate better to counterattack some of the restrictions coming from left, from right, from north, from the south, from everywhere. How can we strategize? So I think that the need for cross-border collaboration is really important. It's happening now. I mean, even in my own organization, the Center for Reproductive Rights, our advocates in the United States are learning from their own colleagues particularly in the global south, mm -hmm. about, and the partners there, about how to make change in places where it was once thought to be impossible. So that is so important. I think it's also important to think about the many different avenues to rights protection in law. So, you know, in the United States, when the Supreme Court slammed the door on constitutional protections in the United States Constitution, we did not take that as the final answer. Advocates in the US are working to look at state legislation, they're looking at federal legislation, they're looking at state courts, they're looking at other ways that rights can be protected. And that's really important. I mean, I think about a very important night last year in Michigan 
It was one of the states where people took it into their own hands to change their own constitution in the state of Michigan. Mm. And they knocked on doors, and they raised money, and they talked to people, and they were not silent. And there I was on election night with all of these volunteers, and when the constitutional amendment votes were counted, it was a huge win. And for the first time, the words reproductive freedom were in the Constitution of the state of Michigan. It was the first time before Dobbs, no state in the United States had reproductive freedom in their Constitution. <laughs> and just the collective power in that room, and it's the collective power we can across, have across borders, shows how change is possible mm -hmm. to be made stronger. So I would just say to everyone, wherever you are, wherever you're working, you know, when one door closes, find the other door that can open because there are many ways to protect rights and just never, ever, ever give up. Of course, when one door closes, we can open another one, and we can even kick a door if it's closed, if it is to serve reproductive freedom, if it is to serve women's, girls, and everyone's reproductive health and right. You made a key point about language. We need to change language and make sure that the appropriate language is reflected, but also, in engaging and involving lawmaking. And I'm really excited to see that we have in the audience parliamentarians for different countries advancing gender equality in their respective settings. I'm gonna come back to Dr. Ako and hear your perspective now about how can we move forward? What are some of the successful initiatives that exist or that can be applied to improve access to safe abortion? For example, in Benin, there's been a great progressive development around the conversation on abortion. I won't say more. In other countries, there's more progress going on as well. In other countries, we have pushback. Based on your experience, what is working and how can we work better? The wins are many. Mm -hmm. All is not lost. You have cited Benin, but um, there are several countries since the ICPD in 1994 that has liberalized the abortion laws. I think there are more than 50. And um, Benin is the most recent. They have the most, one of the most liberal laws on abortion on this continent. Another example exists. The DRC moved from contraception and abortion being illegal to contraception and abortion being fully accessible just by ratifying and domesticating the Maputo Protocol. And therein lies one solution. We need to throw our collective weight behind the Maputo Protocol and behind the African Union's decriminalization of abortion campaign because in there lies the solution for African-grown uh, contextual um, responses to the abortion problem. We also have been very um, inspired by the green wave in Central and Latin America. Mm because it has shown us, it has shown us how cohesive social movements can engender change, even in the most restrictive settings. And back to your point on collective power, this is something that we should strive to do more, to come together as social and grassroots movements to build a groundswell that will eventually percolate upwards into change in the abortion space and environment. But of course, there are technologies we take advantage of. IPAS has been at the forefront of medication abortion, and this is a technology that we should all move to popularize as power in the hands of women. That's excellent, and um, I thank you for sharing those success stories, and I'm really proud to share that because I'm Beninese by birth, even if the U.S. is trying to adopt me, and I'm, I'm really excited to see that countries can learn from one another, like Mrs. Northrop said, how can countries learn from one another? I think it's really critical, and I think we also need to celebrate all the advocates, all the policymakers, researchers, academicians, and everyone in this room working to make sure that access is universal for all. <laughs> Give a round of applause and a kudos to yourself. Because you said wins are many, and we need to acknowledge the wins. We need to acknowledge that the work that you are achieving is resulting in positive change. So coming to you, Mrs. Charlize, very quickly before we end, how can 
intersectionality be brought into this important conversation that we are having around abortion rights? Uh, yes, intersectionality, uh, as we all have been talking about, it plays a very crucial role in recognizing the privileges and the discrimination that has been happening in the world, the oppression which are shaped by the intersections in terms of age, gender, race, ethnicity, and the list goes on. But uh, it is very important that we collectively work together a collaborative effort is very essential to ensure that intersectional approach is adopted in everything we, we do. Every advocacy works, every programs, plans, in everything that we do, we need to be sure that intersectional approaches are adopted. So uh, starting with uh, centering the experiences uh, and the voices of those uh, who, are, who have not been heard. Uh, there are voices of intersectional uh, population, the minorities, the marginalized communities uh, whose uh, voices have been oppressed through ages, since ages, and also uh, like the experiences and their uh, uh, personal lived experiences, it helps a lot to identify the issues, the needs, the challenges that uh, different groups and their diverse intersectionality have been facing. So centering the experiences and also addressing the systemic barriers that exist in our policies and in our interventions. So it is important to identify a collaboration, a collaborative movement where inclusion and uh, comprehensiveness is adopted in every uh, healthcare system and also in information dissemination and awareness. So the movement, it, does not, uh, it is not limited by boundaries. All, every uh, continent, every, uh, the whole world needs to come together to uh, raise a collective voice so that the intersectional approach of every individual is heard and plans, programs, and policies are developed in a similar manner. So thank you. Perfect. So while I have my speaker seated there, I would like to remind us one again that sexual and reproductive health and rights are human rights. Yes. <laughs> Girls, women, men, rights are human rights. Gender diverse people's rights are human rights. Les droits sexuels et reproductifs sont des droits humains. Les droits des filles, des femmes, des garçons sont des droits humains. Les droits des personnes orientées sexuelles différentes sont des droits humains. And I would like to thank all speakers, and I want to still keep them on stage, because we have a very frank and honest conversation about abortion rights. We discussed about challenges, opportunities when it comes to advocating, but also advancing access to service, safe and legal abortion. We discussed about social, social stigma. We discussed about social mobilization, community engagement. We also discussed about stakeholder engagement. And the message is clear. Accessing safe and legal abortion is a right. So during this plenary, for my closing words, during this plenary, we had the opportunity to address three key pillars. The first one, access to SRHR for all. The second one, bodily autonomy and right-based framing. The third one, abortion rights for all. It was such a delight, such a privilege to moderate this session. I'm Joanne Bewa, and this was plenary three, SRHR and bodily autonomy. Thank you, and thank you, distinguished speakers. We can leave the stage. A round of applause for the speakers, please. I cannot hear you, folks. I want to hear more of this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. To be in my